Hello everyone, this is Smita Mishra, a tester and a sustainability enthusiast, welcoming you. So good morning, good afternoon and good evening to all of you joining us from across the globe. While we understand life is a bit boring and mentally taxing to not be able to meet people or to do a lot of things we would have been doing otherwise in a normal pre-COVID world uh, and continuous focus on social distancing and sanitization may be taking its toll. We still hope you all are doing well and taking care of yourself and staying safe. With that said, welcome to our today's episode of the STP training webinar series. The title for our talk today is BDD plus Gherkin minus BDD is equal to happiness. Okay, and our guest speaker joining us on the webinar is Bas Hammer. I'm excited today to host you all and Bas on the, on the STP webinars. But before we get started with the webinar, let me quickly share a couple of important updates that may interest you. Most of you may be aware of what we do, but for the benefit of those who are new to STP events, let me tell you, we host our flagship event, STPCon twice a year, STPCon spring and STPCon fall. And we are now approaching the time for our fall conference. Something we all are aware of is that COVID seems to be continuing to pose health safety issues uh, for any kind of large gathering. And considering we have a huge base of international speakers and global attendees, it only seemed uh, unfair to do a limited event in the US itself for a limited audience with a limited set of speakers. And so we have done our researches and figured out tools and technologies to make sure we are not only able to move our entire conference content to virtual platform, which is going to be accessible to anyone from any country on the planet, but also keep the conferring experience as close as possible to the in-person events. We're doing this in the spirit of continued education and not breaking the momentum of learning for our invaluable attendees whom we support in everything we do. So we are hosting the online event, STPCon Virtual 2020, on the 29th and 30th of September. You can review the speakers and the sessions and the workshops and also register for the same at stpcon.com. You can see the link on the slide. If you have any questions or doubts, feel free to email them to us at info at softwaretestpro.com. There is an upcoming webinar, Applying Software Craftsmanship to the Evolving World of Automation on the 19th of August. The speaker for this is Kathy Segel, who is a quality lead manager at Three Pillar Global. During this talk, Kathy will be focusing on the shift of existing Selenium to the actual implementation of JS-based testing tools how and when to use them, when to pick them as an automation tool for building a framework. The link is up for you to register. Please do go for it. Also, we are inviting proposals for STP webinars from all of you, and this shall be open all year round, so you can submit anytime you are ready. All the details along with the submission form are at the link given on the screen. Please go through them. In case you have recommendations on topics or speakers, do email them to us. We will be happy to hear from you. And if you are on Twitter, please share the call for papers information and also about this webinar with your followers and connections and also about the virtual conference. You can add STP's Twitter handle to your tweets, which is at Software Test Pro. Please do add the hashtag STP webinar to your tweets. Also, please note down the Twitter handle of our speaker today. And also, please take note of the organization's Twitter handle, which is at Possum Labs. Do follow them and continue the conversation beyond this webinar. All right, let's get started with the webinar now. Welcome, Buzz. We are very excited to have you with us today. Uh, let me quickly introduce you for all of us here. Buzz Hammer uh, is the founder of uh, Possum Labs, and he started his career as a developer, and his perennial quest to solve problems made him to become a good developer and then an architect, and then finally landed him an opportunity to work with the QA team. Planned to turn them into developers and instead built them a tool, a domain-specific language 
that suited their needs better. The tool was created, removed sources of conflict by offering human readable tests and large API refactors had a minimum impact on Q. Okay, thank you, Smita. Okay, so yeah, I'm Bas Hammer from Possum Labs, and today I'll be talking about experiences that I've had in trying to leverage BDD and finding out that, that there's a lot of good things inside of it that we ended up uh, leveraging, but we also ran into some of the challenges with the underlying premise behind it. So as mentioned, my background um, is primarily development. Uh, I really started out as a developer and I really enjoyed teaching. And this brought me into an opportunity where I was asked to help a QA team and they were behind the schedule, they were the roadblock of new development, and they had to catch up. And working with them and understanding what their requirements were and, and building tools for them to help them catch up is really what started me on this journey. And I've helped three different organizations uh, do this type of implementation with DSL-based testing, and we're we'll talking about that later. Um, and I've open sourced most of the framework because I mean, I've, I've written it once, I don't want to write it again. So what is the problem with BDD? Well, the biggest problem with BDD, and this is a very large problem, it's about a trillion dollars problem just in the US, is legacy software. There is an incredibly large amount of legacy software out there. And BDD doesn't claim to address this, you know, far from it, it's really focused on new development. But there's so much of it out there and it tackles some of the core issues that people face in legacy software. And we'll dig into this later on. And the other part of the talk is, you know, the one thing we all have more of, happiness, right? How, how can we make our lives better? And how can we actually construct it? Can we just break it down into the requirements and then use those requirements to actually improve our lives? So first let's talk about legacy software, right? What, what makes things legacy is a very important question because people have different definitions around it. And then we'll talk about what tools we have to address these things and how we can try to start trying to solve the problems that are coming from legacy. And then we'll talk about how to structure this into happiness. And if there's time left, we'll talk about some other possibilities. So I wrote my first legacy software right out of college. Um, this was in 2004. Um, I had about two weeks of software development experience, professional software development experience. I finished the project early and I was asked to build something which was a pet project for another developer. I created it, took a couple of weeks to build um, and it is in use to this day, right? So up until this point, I had two weeks of software development experience, and now this thing has survived for 16 years. I had no clue what you'd have to do to make software stay healthy for 16 years, because I had never worked with software that was that old. I, the oldest software I'd ever encountered was a couple of months during my time in college. So a lot of problems, were created by me at this point, just because I had no concept of what was going to happen in the long run. And this is happening to everyone, right? What ended up happening is that software stopped dying. And, and the reason that software stopped dying is because technology changes. We have virtual machines like Java and .NET, which showed up, right? Which made software just more resilient to updates and changes to the operating systems. We start separating ourselves from client hardware, right? We we're kind of going back onto client hardware with mobile, but on the desktop side, we start moving a lot of things to the web. And when they start to move to the web, again, we're separated from the hardware. When the hardware gets replaced, the website is still there, right? Nobody runs into a website and the website says, I'm sorry, I'm no longer compatible, right? Some of them will start developing some quirks, but they're very resilient. And the other things that really make software stick around is when they're internal applications. And the reason for this is that you can't buy an off the shelf alternative. That software I built right out of school, it was to search their proprietary log files. Of course, nobody else has built software to search a company's proprietary log files because only that company uses them. So there's no alternative for them to use. 
And because there was no alternative for them to use, this thing just keeps on chugging 16 years. And the other thing that will make software tend to stick around a lot longer is risk adverse industries, banks, healthcare, and government. Right? These organizations just do not really want to adopt new technology for good reason. Right? If you're an early adopter of new technology, you're taking on risk. And all of these organizations don't really want the risk. They want to just make sure that things keep on going. And because software started sticking around much longer, we really changed the, 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 the cycle of development, right? Because pre-2000, so this is a long time ago now in software years especially, you, you build some software, take a couple of years, you support it for three years, and that was the end of it. But more importantly, you had the same resources, right? Your developer was there for that entire time which meant that knowledge transitions really were not as much of an issue. But in 2000, one of the big changes that happened along with things moving onto the web is that developers start shifting from company to company much more frequently, right? And everyone in the IT industry just has a very high turnover rate. Combine that with the fact that things just stick around forever. So whereas before, you know, you didn't really have to worry about this, 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 this transition of knowledge, these days, the transition of knowledge to future generations of people working on the project is very important because they're only going to be around for a couple of years. And if they're only going to be around for a couple of years and something is alive for 16 years, that means you have a lot of these transitions that you have to manage. And you can't really say like, well, if we get half the information across, that's fine because you know by the time you're four or five layers down the line, you only have a very tiny percentage of the information left. And to me, that is the important thing about legacy. It's not an age, right? You can get to legacy slow or fast. The, 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 the idea is that you've lost. You've lost information. You no longer know what went into the decisions that made things happen. And because you lose some of this information, it hinders your ability to effectively support the application or enhance it because you just have to relearn some of those lessons multiple times sometimes as an organization, and that's very expensive. So let's talk about the tools, right? Because we've known this legacy software problem exists and, and we started to develop methods to try and prevent it and, and manage it. And one of the things is TDD, right? That it came out of extreme programming. It actually predates 2000, like 1999. And the short version of this is write tests before code. And we also end up with Agile a couple of years later, right? It, it really focused on, on the individuals, making sure you have working software, right? You had the collaboration aspect and the ability to respond to change because we all know that planning is only so good. Unfortunately, a lot of people like to focus just on the last bit, which is just, just don't follow a plan and start building stuff. Um, and this, actually can shortchange documentation and, and the capturing of knowledge. So Agile can help sometimes and hurt other times. And we have BDD. BDD actually came out in 2006, right? And it is not easily defined. But to me, the idea is that you create a living, self-verifying document before you code. Right? It's a collaborative effort to create this document that everyone can understand and agree upon, and then that can verify itself, and then the code will match that verification. But more importantly, these things happened a while ago. Right? TDD is 1999, Agile is 2001. Both of those are widely adopted now, but that took at least a decade. BDD is starting to receive a lot more press these days and there's more organizations that are shifting towards it. But again, it's, it's, it's a decade, which means there's just a very large amount of software that started to be built for the web in the last 20 years that doesn't have a lot of these technologies and some of it doesn't have any of it. But let's also keep in mind how these things try to adjust later of legacy, right? With TDD, 
what you end up doing is you're pushing the point of legacy further away. And the reason for that is because these tests start documenting your tests or your code better, and it gives you uh, more context while you're working on the application, right? Bad Agile brings the point of legacy closer because if you had something like Waterfall, a lot of artifacts were created in the process. A lot of documents were created in the process. They may not be maintained, but a lot of things were created that no longer seem to be created in Agile, right? They're like short tickets and tasks on, on the board. And a lot of that understanding of how decisions were made, um, it's not there, right? You don't have documents with many versions that tend to get out of Agile. And for the people who are really low on the process side with Agile, it can actually make the legacy point you know, creep much closer because what ends up happening is a lot of these artifacts, you know, we're kind of keeping knowledge alive and now they're not being created anymore. And BDD tries to actually prevent legacy, right? It actually tries to say like, hey, we're gonna create this living self-verifying document, which is always up to date because it, it's self-verifying, right? If it's no longer up to date, the test shouldn't pass anymore. And it should prevent legacy. But none of these things will unlegacy your code. Right? That's also not really their goal. But there's so much legacy code out there and, and people have it and it's producing value for organizations. They want to maintain it. They have invested millions, billions, and if you take all of it together, trillions of dollars into this stuff. They don't want it to go away. So all of these technologies that focus on loss prevention don't really help them with just keeping the thing that they have, even though it was built with these unfortunate practices of the past. Um, another way to look at this, these technologies is, is to talk about what problems they prevent, right? Because there's, there's two things we want to get to work in code. We need a developer that understood what to do, and you need a developer that executed correctly, right? Both of those two things have to be true for working code. If a developer understood what to do, but made mistakes, you got bugs, right? That makes sense. If a developer executed correctly, but didn't understand what to do, you also have bugs, or you have things that are just implemented wrong, whatever terminology you want to use for it. And if they didn't understand it and then make, made mistakes on top of it, I mean, who knows what you have at that point. But the interesting thing is that this, this knowledge that has been lost in legacy tends to create a lot of bugs where people just didn't quite understand the nuance of what they were trying to accomplish. Right? You have a lot of bugs that start to creep in because people made a bad assumption. They, they are usually working with a very large body of software to begin with, and they're making modifications to it, and they're making assumptions on what certain things do and what they mean when those assumptions may no longer be valid. It, they might not be valid because it was never really valid to begin with, but it might also not be valid because the business has changed. Right? A, a business may start catering to a B2B market, like business to business, and now they're going business to customer, B2C, and their software is written with a lot of this B2B knowledge inside of it. So when you're maintaining that code as, as, as a person who's unfamiliar with it, it's very likely you're going to have to keep in mind like, okay, it's talking about a company here, but really it's more like an individual these days and we never cleaned it up because the amount of effort involved in it was cost prohibitive. You know, and that's kind of where the, 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 the test coverage and the cost of testing and the risk of changes all start to work together to make things more and more legacy over time. These technologies we just talked about, they map to this, right? Because if a developer understood what to do, but made mistakes, and you use TDD, these issues will be prevented. Right? Because if the developer understood what to do, they wrote the tests to mirror that behavior, which they correctly understood, and they make a mistake, the test should catch it. And in the unfortunate case where people didn't quite understand what to do and made mistakes, well, if you do agile and you have frequent demos, you start catching these things early on. 
right? Because the demos won't work or the demos will show things that are completely wrong. It, it will improve that feedback cycle. And BDD is tackling that last box, right? And this is the box we see a lot in Agile where we have developers that did not quite understand what to do, even though they executed correctly what they thought was the correct thing to do. And because of this, a lot of companies that have legacy software are, are eyeing BDD and, and they really want BDD to come and solve some of their problems. But that's the problem with BDD because BDD is built around the concept of you create a document, then you create the code. And in a legacy application, you can't do that without a type machine. Right? So we can't use the BDD process, but BDD is two parts, right? There's the methodology and then there's the tooling, right? And the tooling is like the Gherkin and the libraries and the code, whereas the BDD methodology is talking about creating these documents up front and the process around how these documents are constructed and the, the workflow in the organization. And we know we can't satisfy this workflow, right? Because sometimes we're trying to work on things that were written a decade ago. And we're, we're, we're really kind of trying to rebuild that, tech, the, that knowledge. But we can use Gherkin. And Gherkin can still address some of these challenges because Gherkin inherently is human readable, right? And this is where the idea came in from a domain specific language, something that is accessible, right? That feels more like configuration versus coding and is people friendly. So people can understand it and it can improve communication and people can respond to the, 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 these, this knowledge expressed in Gherkin and say like, hey, this is valid, or they can come back and say like, no, this is not the way it ought to be working. And what you'll find in older organizations is that quite often this process is educational for everyone involved because sometimes there's people who believe things are supposed to work one way, whereas other people in the organization believe it's supposed to work another way. But because there wasn't a source of truth in the organization, they were never able to interact and communicate and figure out exactly where their uh, conceptions were misaligned. Regardless who, of who was right, you know, it, it's, it's about making sure that people understand how things work today and how things ought to work and they have the ability to communicate it. Now, domain-specific languages are, are scary, right? You, you think of like HTML or regular expressions or things like that, but most people use domain-specific languages, right? Chances are your parents or your kids use domain-specific languages. Here's a domain-specific language, right? Alexa set a pizza timer for 20 minutes, right? Then you can check how much time is left on your pizza. You can ask what timers you have. You can cancel your pizza timer. And anyone who uses a voice assistant understands that a voice assistant does not understand English. It understands commands, right? It understands a subset of English. And when you look at this, this isn't that far removed from Gherkin, right? It's not given when then, it's just Alexa, 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 but the structure is the same. It, it has some very simple uh, logic around it. But then it just kind of matches the, the pattern of just these words and is mapped to a specific command. Right? It doesn't understand the words. It understands that this sentence, right, set a something timer for something minutes, right? that block of text, that regular expression, if you will, should map to this function and should execute this function passing in these parameters. It is very similar to Gherkin. And a lot of people are using this. It's very successful. People do not feel like they're coding. Right? And we can write tests like this. Is this a good BDD test? No, this is a terrible BDD test. This is probably not even a very good DSL test, but it's a very simple idea of a test. Right, given, navigated to Google when entering Possum Labs into the element search and clicking the element Google search, then the page contains the element Possum Labs. 
there's a couple of things in here that are not ideal, right? The hard coding of like the, 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 the URL and things like that, we don't want, but it's very understandable. People can understand it and read it. Now, this is not feasible to write in this format for large systems. For large systems, you need to have a more complex language and you create your own custom elements for that language. But it's very understandable. Right? This is kind of how you give instructions to somebody over the phone on how to interact with the system. And leveraging this has nothing to do with BDD in a way. We're, we're leveraging the same tools and the tools were initially developed for BDD, but we can leverage them outside of BDD. And organizations like it because it makes things more understandable and readable. And the people who have been at the organization longer, which are quite often a little bit more removed from the IT side because IT has so much turnover, can validate this. They can read this and understand it. They might not be able to write it, but they definitely can read it and understand it. Now, Gherkin has a couple of problems, right? First of all is maintenance. Uh, if you're not careful, what ends up happening is that the number of steps you're maintaining, right? These are like the little language constructs that you have to understand, tends to go linearly with the number of tests. And it's very hard to refactor. Refactoring Gherkin is not like refactoring code. And the reason for that is, oh, and the reason for that is the tooling. The tooling just isn't really there yet. Now, here is an example of how you can take a, uh, a DSL approach towards Gherkin. And the idea behind a DSL approach is a domain specific language, you're designing the language to make the language powerful enough to express what you need to express. And you would like to make this language easy to reuse. And, and what you end up doing is you're kind of taking a step away from English towards code, right? DSL of a BDD should be mostly English. DSL is a little bit closer to code than just English. So what we have here is we, we define a company, we give it a name, right? Names are useful because then we can refer to things later. Alexa does this, right? We had a pizza timer. That's a variable name, right? We can still navigate to Google. We can then enter c1.name into the element search. And by just implementing the capability of for um, variables and this dot notation, you can see how it becomes much easier to actually reuse steps, right? And this is where you start to be able to leverage these pieces of functionality much more effectively. And you can we can build stories with them. And of course, every business is going to have their own constructs. They're gonna have their own entities like a company in here. Um, and what you're able to do is you can then define how the business should work. You can effectively set up the data, structure the data, and create the scenarios that people can then validate. All right, so another problem with Gherkin, I talked about this earlier, is the tools, right? It, it's IDE and command line, and that is very intimidating. Um, step discovery is also not great in most tools as well. Um, this is Visual Studio. Uh, Visual Studio is something that, um, I mean, I know it because I've used it for decades, but even when I hear about people starting to learn how to write software, I'm like, don't use Visual Studio, go take something simpler because it has so many features. I just like, this is like the legacy software. Built around 2000, just kept adding features and it's completely overwhelming. And when people hear configuration, they, they think of like, you know, a pair of shoes, right? There's lots of ways you can configure a pair of shoes. They don't want to look at code. Code is very intimidating and a lot of people believe that they are unable to do that, uh, whether that's true or false. I think a lot of it has to do just with perception and not fantastic tooling. The tooling is too general purpose, not specific for what they're trying to solve. So Gherkin, can tackle some of these challenges that we have with legacy software. 
right? We can capture information on how the system is supposed to work. We can capture it in a human readable syntax. We can have this validation from the business and we can clear up this misunderstanding of how things are supposed to work. And that is really the thing that, that people are trying to solve with legacy is, is to rebuild the knowledge and it can solve these problems. But again, like the tooling is less than ideal. Now let's talk about the other part, right? Because I promised you guys that this could make you happier. Right, and QA, uh, th there are some not great parts to QA, right? You often are the ones to bear bad news. Um, it's really frustrating when you have to work with people who say like this thing is done, but then you find out they implemented the wrong thing. Right? That is a, a super frustrating experience for everyone involved. For the developer, it's like, oh, well, this thing isn't done. And by the way, this task is much bigger than I thought it was. And, and everything I've done effectively is useless in the, in the worst case scenario. But it's also frustrating for everyone else in the organization because once people see things progress and you find out one of these miscommunications when testing starts happening, you have a really hard time um, you know, adjusting expectations because people kind of were like thinking that that work was done, right? It was in their checking account, but it's not. It's it's not really done until the end. And unfortunately, we're the gatekeepers of that in organizations. And last part is configuration. Like configuration is a nightmare. When people ask like, why didn't you test for this one scenario? Well, here's a simple configuration page. I don't even know what application this is. I just looked nice and simple and clean. But when you dig into it and you start looking like, okay, well, all of these things have a couple of options to test everything. That's 125,000 test cases. We can't test all the permutations. We, we just have to kind of pick and choose and assume that certain things work independent of other things, right? If, if we have two fields and they start to interact with each other, that's much more difficult to test than if the fields are all independent from each other. And we don't necessarily have the visibility to understand exactly when things are interacting with each other. So one of the challenges that we have is empathy, right? And, and that's because people in the organization have a very hard time, hopefully the dog's scratching is not too bad, uh, have a really hard time relating to the problems that we're encountering because they they, are, they haven't seen it, they haven't experienced it. And it's very difficult to relate that information. And what we, well, I think the slides went out of order. And, and the reason we, we, we really care about this, right? We want less turnover. I want better engagement. Happiness is for most organizations important. But yeah, the, the empathy, problems we can solve by trying to make things more relatable and understandable. All right, so let's talk about how to build happiness. And one of the ways you can do that is by just taking the breakdown of happiness and read it as requirements. And this is uh, one of the ways people have built it out is to break it down to positive emotions, emotions, engagement, relationships, meaning, and accomplishments. Um, we're not going to go quite in this order, but we can work on relationships, right? And what we want with these, these, these relationships is to make them positive, nurturing, and rewarding. And what ends up happening when you start to capture information in the organization in a human readable format, you can actually work with people and say like, hey, can you validate this? Does this work the way you expect it to? And by doing that, you're effectively building up these relationships, right? And rather than people arguing, uh, arguing with each other, right? Being in a position where you have to say like, I believe it should work this way. The developer says it should work that way. Now you can say, here's a document. Is this the way it ought to work? And people can argue with the document, which is much better than arguing with other people. The other part is meaning, right? And it's important, especially these days, like with all of us working from home, meaning is, is for some people very difficult because finding your work rewarding without the social interactions, this can be very challenging, right? 
But what ends up happening when you start creating these uh, these artifacts that are understandable and capturing these stories, people in the organization will start to see the meaning of what you do and the value of what you do because they can comprehend what is being tested and what is not being tested. Right? Because this language is in there again. Accomplishments, right? We all like to pursue achievements. We want to master things, right? We have hobbies for this, or we ended up in software development where you always have to learn new things. And for organizations to, to comprehend and see the progress of what's being covered by tests, because they can actually read it and it's transparent, you are going to receive more of the sensation of accomplishment because other people will see it too. And that, that is very rewarding. Engagement. This is like the sense of flow. This is like when you, when you forget to eat lunch. You're doing something, you're having fun, you're enjoying it, and then it's five o'clock and you realize you're really hungry. Right? That is the sense of flow, at least to me. And by creating more powerful tools in this DSL testing, it makes it a lot faster to create test cases. Um, and because you can build upon existing language, you, you can create just a couple of new entities in your language and you opens up a whole slew of things you can now um, probe in the system. And this is one of those cases where just having better tools will make it more enjoyable because it's faster to do things and that that allows you to just stick in that mode for longer. And the last part is positive emotions, right? Um, and what ends up happening in organizations when, when you start to in this transition is you kind of are starting to morph the role of QA. Like initially it's, it's gatekeeping, right? Your cost center, your, you know, lots of organizations, when, when things do not go well, QA ends up receiving a lot of cuts. And what's happening in this transition is you're becoming law keepers, right? People understand the value you are creating. They understand that what you're doing is you're ensuring the future success of the organization by capturing the information so it's available for people who come after you and after us and after everyone else who works there. And that's how you can actually use this kind of approach to build happiness, right? It's not just about cleaning up the communication and helping developers understand, hey, this is how things ought to be working. But through that process and through those interactions, you can actually enrich your life quite a bit because you do get to interact with everyone and people do start to understand and comprehend and appreciate the work you're doing much more because it's more visible to them. And they also can develop more empathy because they understand to a much better degree exactly what you're trying to do and what you're faced with. Um, let's go to questions first. And then if there's a spare time, we can always um, look at some other things as well. Thanks, Gus. Uh, it was a very insightful session. So thank you so much. We do have questions. Uh, so the first question is, what language is used to interconnect Gherkin and the code base in which language logic is coded? Do you use UI automation and what framework is used? Sure. Um, my background is in C Sharp. So Gherkin is the general language. The implementation of Gherkin for C Sharp is called SpecFlow. Um, but Gherkin exists in a lot of different languages. Now, Gherkin itself, out of the box, doesn't come with a UI piece. Uh, I'm using Selenium 4. And uh, I have a, a, an open source project that exposes all of the, of the, that has all of the libraries for interacting with Selenium uh, and Gherkin. Um, and yeah, I'm using C Sharp, but I've also used JavaScript uh, for one of the projects as well. So 
the, the, the concept of the Gherkin is really something that can be applied to lots of different languages, programming languages. Because as you might imagine, the only thing that's really happening is you're parsing a line of text and you're mapping it to a function to a regular expression. And that's the same across all different pieces of, of all different implementations of uh, Gherkin. So even if it doesn't exist for your language, which chances are it probably does, it's not actually that much work to build it. Great. Um, so we'll move on to the next question. Yep. Um, do you advocate for writing Gherkin tests in QA, even if the tests do not get automated right away, even for months or years? I, I there's There's two ways about that. So one of the challenges with just using Gherkin is that uh, automating it becomes a lot of work, right? Because you write a lot of test cases, you're creating a lot of pieces of your language, right? Of all of these statements, all of the unique statements you have. And that can create a giant backlog of test cases. I don't think that's a good idea. Right, because that, that really starts to look a lot like uh, manual test cases where you have steps and you're just kind of reformatting the English into something that looks like Gherkin. I would say that when you're building things, take some time up front and say, let's design the language. Let's, let's figure out what is the, the, the smallest vocabulary of statements we need to express what we want to do and then write your test using that language. And what you'll find is you have to implement far fewer steps so you don't end up with that backlog. Um, if you write Gherkin test cases that don't get implemented for months or years, you have manual test cases. They're just written in something that looks like Gherkin, but you might actually be making your life harder because you are building a very large vocabulary for people to utilize in building new test cases, right? Because what ends up happening is, is new people or existing people, they're going to leverage and look at these old test cases, look at the old syntax that's used in there, these old statements that are used in there, even though they're not automated yet, and leverage those in new test cases and create some new ones wherever they need them. So, um, I think you're not going to do yourself any favors taking that approach. I think you're far better off structuring your language and designing your language very explicitly upfront and keeping the number of statements you have to automate as low as possible and then leveraging a very small vocabulary to write your test cases. And if you can't automate that right away, you're still looking at a very manageable amount of work to um, catch up. Whereas if you you don't do that and you actually just start writing English that looks like Gherkin, I think you're going to have a very hard to implement and even harder to maintain solution in the long run. Thanks, Buzz. Uh, I think on, on the same lines, there is another question. Uh, I'm going to ask you the question. If you think it requires more explanation, please go for it or we will move on to the next one. The question is, uh, Gherkin applies to manual and automation testing? Like, does it apply to both? Well, you can. You can manually execute Gherkin, right? Um, and, and I think that even in manual test cases, uh, there is value in limiting your language and being very specific about what words you use. So humans, care a lot about language, right? We express a lot of our individuality in our language and our intelligence in our language. Like there's people who will make fun of other people because of how few words they use. And that is very unfortunate because when we're dealing with software, we kind of would like to use as few words as possible because it removes a lot of ambiguity. So, I think that, that some of these things do apply to manual test cases. I think that for manual test cases, having a very narrow vocabulary that people leverage to write the test cases is going to remove ambiguity and it's going to help future generations 
to uh, understand the, the domain, the, the problems you're trying to solve and test and how the software is supposed to work faster because there's fewer words to try and understand the word, the, the, the meaning of. Right? And if you have a very narrow language and you see like login over in one place and email in another place, you know those two things are different. But for most of us, you know, there's probably a concept like an account, a login, and an email, and each of us work in a different system. We all have a different understanding of what those words mean and which ones are synonyms of each other. So yeah, I do believe that there's value for manual tests to also have a very uh, directed approach, like a very clear approach towards saying, these are the words that have meaning and we're gonna just use these words in our test cases. Great, that makes sense. Um, moving on to the next question, Bast. PDD process should, uh, should BDD process come before the Gherkin writing? Uh, I mean, if, to understand what needs BDD, to be BDD, right? So if you use BDD and you are writing your test cases before you start to write code, you're in a very fortunate position and, and chances are you don't have to worry about a lot of these issues. If you are in a position where the code has been written, sometimes decades ago, and you're trying to solve some of the same problems that BDD attach, uh, attacks, which is just uh, clarifying this communication, then you, know, you don't have that luxury. And of course, the, the code gets written later. And in those scenarios, because chances are there's a lot of functionality, I would favor designing your language before writing your test cases, which means being very um, focused on, on building the ubiquitous language. This is what they call it in domain-driven design, um, like the, the, the smallest set of language you need to describe the system. And then once you have agreed upon what words you're gonna be using, then start to write your test cases. Um, and I think that is very valuable to do uh, because it just reduces duplication. It reduces the chance of something getting implemented twice and possibly having a slightly different implementation. Okay. Um, the next question is: How long could be a, how long would a scenario be in terms of number of lines that would include an and? Is there a restriction? So the the the. That's an interesting question. So the question is, you know, how long can it be? But it's also a question of how wide can it be, right? It It's not just about length, it's about context. What you want to ensure is that you have a concise way to express the context that is present before the action is taken and then verification of the results of that action. And if your language isn't very powerful, right, then building that context could be very complicated. For instance, um, let's say that you want to uh, get your tires changed, right? You go to a particular tire center, you start a transaction with them and say like, hey, I need these tires, they thought they had them in stock, they didn't have them in stock. You end up taking your car to another tire center. They did have the tires that you want uh, available and they complete that transaction. Now, if you're trying to test a software where some user starts a transaction as at one location and then finishes the transaction at another location, and you're trying to check the inventory and everything else, that's very difficult. But it's also very understandable that that might be a very important use case to verify, right? Because you might be able, that might be one of those cases where there was a bug that you had to fix. So when you have longer scenarios, like that, that would clearly be a longer scenario because you have set up of the first location, the second location, a customer, you have to get the inventory in the right state, all of those things. That is, you know, that, that, that immediately means that people are gonna spend less time reading it. So for like, for very specific scenarios, it is fine for them to be long. 
and that can be like 50 lines because it is attacking a very specific scenario and it is very explicit about the condition the data is in at the point where the action is taken. But don't put all of that context, like all of the setup in all of your test cases, right? So, so keep them short and more people will read them. And if you have to make them longer to test for a specific weird corner condition, then you can do that. But people should very quickly realize, hey, this thing is way longer, and that should mean it is far more specific. So I wouldn't focus much on, on the length. I would focus more on how easy it is for people to consume the information. And then I would also focus on like how can we make it easier for people to consume the information, right? Because humans are the ones reading them. The computers verify them. Computers don't care. They can read as long as you want. But for humans to read them, you want to keep it concise. And sometimes it's easier to express things in 15 short statements rather than like five long statements. And in those cases, take the 15 short statements because it's easier for people to understand it. Great. Um, moving on to the next one, Buzz. How do you write and implement Gherkin scenarios and automate within a sprint? Um, so the way that we uh, have done that is the first thing we usually do is it's maybe not at the sprint level, but at, at the epic level where you say like, well, we're going to add the following features to the system. We're going to look at what syntax we need to express in Gherkin, our domain specific language, these new features. Like for, for instance, I had one project and we added a concept of a project. That's a bad example. Let's say it, uh, a task. We created a, the concept of a task and a task could be shared and there was some weird security around it. And we've just talked about it and said, okay, well, this is what we're gonna call it. We're gonna call the task. And then we're going to uh, work through the, the, the process and figure out what statements we're going to have to implement. And once we figured out those statements and we had agreed on those statements, we could start writing the Gherkin test cases and do the implementation of the statements in parallel, right? Because we had already agreed upon what the language was going to be to express this new concept. So that's how we were able to do it you know, during a sprint for new features, but that's also how we would tackle implementing uh, test cases for like all parts of the system during sprints as well, right? We would just look at one particular part of the system, we'd build out the language, we then would build out a roadmap on how to get to the, the, the main screens in there and the main parts of it and just do the happy case testing. And then once we had that available, we were then able to branch out and start testing for more uh, corner conditions or like weird use cases or things we knew that were bugs. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the, the approach we have. It is really a, a focus on language design. And then when the language is designed, you can actually start working in parallel as you know everyone can, under, can leverage that language. Great. Um, so moving on to the next question. Is there, uh, yeah, is there any tool to get test execution reports if we run Gherkin scenarios manually? Well, if you run the, the, the test manually, then it really depends on like what system you have. So for instance, if you have something like, uh, what's it called these days, Azure Teams? Oh, anyway, uh, Visual Studio Teams, it's been renamed. It's I think it's like Azure DevOps. That's what it's called these days then you can have test cases in there that will look like manual test cases, which can be expressed in Gherkin and you can run them manually and capture the results in there manually, right? And then, then everything will show up in there and you can capture the information in there. There's no reason that, you know, if you have a test case that is written in Gherkin, you can't import that data into any type of manual test a tracking tool and run the tests in there and then uh, take the results 
or, or put the results in that system and reports from it. If you want to combine manual tests written in Gherkin with automated tests written in Gherkin and report them in the same structure, that's going to be much harder and you're going to have a lot more work on your hands trying to figure out how what kind of repository you can put both of those things into. But you're really looking at whatever systems you're using, whether that is you know, the, the, the bamboo side of the house or um, you're using something like Azure DevOps or some other integrated platform that includes all of that stuff, that's what you're going to be looking at. Um, but if you're looking at like, hey, we had manual tests, now our tests are in feature files, how do we get results out of that? Well, one, one of the ways you can do it is you can write a simple application that reads those feature files and imports all of that information into your manual test system. And most of them will have APIs that you can leverage to do that. Okay, uh, that makes sense, Bas. I'm going to ask you two more questions. So this is going to be the second last one. Okay. Um, what tools do you recommend outside of a general version control system to make Gherkin tests more visual to teams, uh, teams like uh, product owners, trainers? Uh, obviously, the binding of steps and code are sourced in a repository. The, 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 the tooling isn't great. Um, Visual Studio Code does a decent job of syntax highlighting, um, but autocomplete doesn't work well. Uh, Visual Studio, even with the SpecFlow plugin, does a mediocre job of step discovery. It, it quite often gets confused. It doesn't handle uh, steps from external assemblies very well or inheritance, uh, for that matter. So the, the tooling is not fantastic um, and because the tooling is not fantastic you're, you're very quickly looking at uh, you know pick your editor of choice and work through the issues um, I, I don't think that there's any tool for you know after the fact writing of gherkin which is very valuable there are some tools in development most of those are really focused on the BDD side of the process. So they're really focused on writing text and then having people, giving people the ability to comment on it and change it and tweak it and, and really focusing on that part of it, not a, on the part of leveraging existing statements and writing new stories using existing statements. Um, I don't think there's anything out there that does a good job at that right now. All right, sorry for that. But all right, I'm going to ask you one last question, and there are questions still flowing in, uh, Buzz. But uh, what we will do is we will share those questions with you, and uh, okay. you could directly respond to the attendees or send it to the STP team, and we could share them as a blog or to the attendees as it seems fine. Okay? Yep, absolutely. All right. So here is the last question, which is a very interesting question. In fact, I also had this question in my mind when I saw the. Uh, saw your submission for the webinar. Uh, that is, uh, the attendee says, can you clarify the title? I did not see how it relates to the talk. I understood that BDD was the problem from the title. A very nice talk, by the way. Thank you. So the challenge is that people are, are, are going into BDD without actually being able to meet the requirements of the process. And maybe the talk needs to have a new title. That, that's quite possible. But the initial uh, challenge that, that I encountered in a number of organizations is that they started to pursue BDD and they're like, but we also have all this legacy software and want to cover it. And by trying to pursue something that by per definition is unattainable, a lot of these projects were set up for failure. Whereas if you walk away from the, the, the concept of BDD, it becomes achievable. And I think that that is the, the, the challenge of the concept of you know, writing human readable tests using Gherkin is very intertwined with the concept of BDD. And by splitting them apart, 
it becomes far more attainable for organizations to be successful. And yeah, maybe I need to work on the title. Uh, it's quite possible. No, that totally makes sense. It was, it was, uh, we uh, just wanted to know. It is actually very interesting. So, yeah. Right. No worries on that. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really hope uh, all the attendees have uh, noted down his LinkedIn that you can see on his screen because we're going to stop sharing his screen. It was a very insightful session, Buzz. Thank you so much. Thank you for Thank you. Uh, telling us, uh, yeah, how technology could actually make our lives better and uh, for introducing Gherkin-based testing, the effects of it. Hey, right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, everyone, this, in, this concludes our webinar for today. Thank you for joining in. And more importantly, thank you for um, being so engaging and making the most of the webinar for yourself and the whole group by asking so many questions. We have STPCon Virtual 2020 coming up uh, on the 29th and 30th September. The whole program is up for you to review and register at stpcon.com. Please do go for it and don't forget to spread the word around with your friends and colleagues. Stay tuned for more webinars at softwaretestpro.com. We have an upcoming webinar which is applying software craftsmanship to the evolving world of automation on the 19th of the August. 19th of August, sorry. The speaker for this is Kyati Segal, who is a quality lead manager at Three Pillar Global. During this talk, Kyati will be focusing on the shift of existing Selenium to the actual implementation of JS-based uh, testing tools. If the subject interests you, please do sign up for the same at softwaretestflow.com. And before I leave, let me also remind you the call for submissions for the webinars is open and will remain open all year round. Please do send in your proposals at the given link. Thank you, everyone. Please stay healthy and safe. Practice safe social distancing and good luck for all you do. Hoping to see you all at the upcoming webinars and the STP Virtual 2020, STPCon Virtual 2020 conference. Thank you.